Hello everybody, welcome back to the Bite Attic. On this episode, I'm going to play with the Specky, the legendary Sinclair ZX Spectrum. I believe this is a 48K version. The serial number, I think it's a rather late one, it's not one of the first ones. Um, I don't know whether it's working. Uh, it was sold as untested, which is usually <laughs> not a good sign, doesn't bode well. Um, but it also gives us an opportunity to play with the machine, play with the internals. I'm very much looking forward to it. So let's get going. And the first thing I will do is to test it uh, using the normal RF. I am assuming that this has not been modified to output composite. Uh, for the power supply, I am using a modern power supply, as usual. You know me better by now, you know that I would never use one of the original power supplies. They are not reliable uh, and when they go, they can take the computer with them. Uh, this is a modern switching mode power supply, regulated. I also attached a on-off switch that you can see here. Uh, because these machines, they were made to be cheap, very, very cheap, a little over 100 pounds, I think, back in the day. The computer for the masses, that was the motto. And, uh, and so a lot of corners were cut. Quality is not the best thing here. They cut even the on-off switch to make it cheaper. So, but here we have a replacement. This is a 9-volt uh, power supply. And let's connect and see if the machine turns on and we get a picture. Turn on the TV as well. Okay, it is producing a video signal. Let's now try uh, the keyboard. Yeah. Okay, number one doesn't work, two doesn't work, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 9 doesn't work, no, it works. P. P doesn't work. Enter doesn't work. Space doesn't work. M works, N works, P. A lot of the keys don't work. This is a pretty common problem. Uh, this is a membrane keyboard. The membrane was probably never replaced uh, and has become faulty. It's not a big deal. I think I will upgrade this Specky in any case to a Spectrum Plus uh, model, which basically will give it another case, which is better for cooling. It's a larger case and, uh, and a new keyboard and membrane. Well, secondhand new. I have a, a Spectrum Plus case and keyboard. They are secondhand but I will uh, refurbish them. Um, and then the keyboard problem should be solved. Uh, it's not anything wrong with the keyboard controller. I don't think there's any problem with the ULA because many of the keys uh, do work. Only some critical keys like P and Enter and Space uh, uh, don't. So that should solve the problem, hopefully. Now let's open it up and see what we find inside. Let's see. I have to be careful now because there is definitely uh, the two keyboard membranes that you see here. Before I pull them out, let me put my ground strap so I don't zap anything. So there are, as usual, there are two ribbon connectors and um, the quality of the membrane. I mean, this membrane was never changed, I can see here. This is one of the originals, so definitely I think the, the membrane uh, inside the keyboard here on top uh, has failed. That's the reason why many keys don't work. So I put this aside. And this is the Specky. Oh man, I get emotional just to, just to look at it. Uh, this gave me so many hours of fun. It was the first computer in which I regularly programmed my own games. It was not the first computer I had. 
my first computer was uh, a Sinclair computer as well, a ZX81, uh, 81, black and white, without sound. So when I got this, back in 83, I think, or late 82, uh, it was amazing because I could create games, program my own games in BASIC, and they had color and sound. It was just unbelievable. I thought this machine was incredibly advanced uh, as a kid. There is definitely something holding it down. Maybe this machine simply was never opened, and that's why it sort of bonded together. Yeah, that's the explanation. Yeah, it was just bonded because it probably was never opened. Nobody probably ever removed the PCB from the case since 1983. <laughs> this is an issue three motherboard. Yeah, 37 years ago. Uh, I'll put this one aside. And this is our board, as expected, a little dirty. Let's look at the back side. Yeah, it seems to be in, in pretty good condition. A lot of people see this rippling here as a problem. They think the, the copper on the board is peeling off. It, it, it actually is not. This is pretty rigid. It's not peeling off at all. This rippling happened already during manufacturing uh, because they used the process to try to put more metal on the ground uh, plane. This is the ground plane that you see here. And they wanted to add more metal to it because it improves uh, uh, the quality of the ground. And that extra metal during manufacturing uh, uh, sort of get this, gets these little ripples in here, like an old man's skin. And, um, but that's normal. There's nothing wrong with it. It's pretty solid, pretty firm. It's not peeling off. Now, maybe this is a good moment to give you a brief, very easy architecture introduction to the ZX Spectrum. So you can follow uh, what we are going to see now. So I'll be right back with more. There are three key parts, key elements uh, to this uh, Spectrum architecture. One of them is an onboard regulated power supply unit. It receives uh, a 9 volt DC signal from the external PSU, a power supply unit, and then it translates that into three different voltages, three different rails, uh, plus 5 uh, volt for the volts for the main logic, minus 5, which is used by the memories, and plus 12, which is also used by the memories and uh, the video uh, circuitry. And those rails are distributed throughout. There is a Z80 CPU, or central, central Processing Unit, which is the brains of the computer, that performs the calculations entailed by a certain application, such as a game. And the ULA, or the Uncommitted Logic Array, this chip is more or less equivalent to the MSX Engine chip that we've seen in Episode 1. It consolidates uh, a lot of the internal interfacing logic, a lot of the internal glue logic that brings the different components of the computer together as one system. Um, this is what characterizes the spectrum as a, well, spectrum. It's what defines the, the computer for what it is. Now, um, very peculiar in this architecture is the fact that the ULA provides the clock signal to the CPU. Now, a clock signal is what we call a square wave signal. It's a series of ticks in time in which a voltage oscillates from 0 to plus 5, stays there for a little while, goes back to 0, stays at 0 for a little while, goes back to 5, and so on and so forth. Each of these uh, 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 ticks here is a clock tick, as we say uh, uh, in, in computer engineering. So it's basically a square wave repeating signal, ideally, in the ideal world. And uh, the use of this clock signal is that a digital processor uh, only performs a step uh, upon a clock tick. The CPU uh, um, divides its tasks uh, in a number of very small steps, and it only takes one of these steps once the clock ticks. If the clock doesn't tick, the CPU does not take the next step, and then it just stops, it halts. It's as if time didn't pass for the CPU. Time only passes when the clock ticks, and the ticks are these little 
uh, uh, zero to five and back to zero voltage uh, uh, oscillations in time that are provided by the ULA. The reason for this we will see shortly. Now, in the real world, of course, no electronic signal can go from zero to five volts instantly. It takes a little while to get there, as you see here, and it also takes a little while to go back from five volts back to zero. So the, a real-world clock signal is not really a square wave. It's more like a, a series of shark fins, as you've seen here. At some point in this series uh, of episodes, we will look on the oscilloscope at how a real-life clock signal uh, looks like. Uh, but this is good enough uh, uh, to kick the CPU into taking the next step in its, in its calculations. Now, there are two parts of the memory system that are exclusive uh, to the CPU. The CPU has uncontented access to the ROM, or read-only memory, which contains you know, the, the instructions that the computer needs to execute immediately upon uh, uh, turning on. And there is a so-called upper RAM, which is basically a user random access memory that can be used for reading and writing. And that is uncontended for, it, for the CPU. The CPU can use this upper RAM at will. The name upper uh, has to do with the fact that the, address, the addresses mapped onto this uh, uh, memory uh, are the higher addresses in the address space, that's all, but it's, it's not a significant detail. And of course you see the two buses that are essential to any computer architecture, the address bus on top, which receives the addresses that go to the upper RAM, and the addresses are decoded by some address decoding logic here, uh, and the result of the read, or in the case of the write, uh, the data that needs to be written into the RAM, uh, goes through the data bus down here. There's another part of the memory system, however, that is contended. It's the so-called lower RAM, because the lower addresses are mapped onto it. It has its own address decoding logic, also connected to the address bus on top and to the data bus below. The difference is that uh, not only the CPU can access the lower RAM, but the ULA as well. And the reason for that is that unlike the MSX architecture that we've reviewed in episode one, um, the video memory in the spectrum is not dedicated. It is shared with the user memory. So the lower RAM is used both for applications, programs, games, um, the, the, the instructions of those games, and also to map the video information that later the ULA has to translate into uh, pixel values uh, to be displayed on the television. Uh, and this is an issue for the spectrum because you cannot have the CPU and the ULA trying to access the lower RAM at the same time. That would be a conflict. In fact, the ULA, which plays the role in this case of the uh, programmable display processor of the MSX architecture. In the case of the Spectrum, even the display processing is incorporated into the ULA, not only the sound generation uh, chip, which was the case in the MSX in episode one. The ULA here uh, does all the audio processing, all the video processing, and all the interfacing logic as well. And since it has to generate a new frame to be displayed on the television at very regular intervals of time, a number of times a second, it needs priority access to the lower RAM, otherwise the user will see a display artifact. Uh, there will be something ugly uh, on the screen and that's not uh, acceptable. So the ULA needs priority. Now, how does the ULA enforce its priority? That's a unique thing in the, in the spectrum architecture. The first thing the ULA does is to take a peek here at the address bus. It takes a peek at two address lines, A15 and A14. And depending on the value of these two lines, uh, uh, which are determined by the address the CPU puts on the address bus, uh, the values uh, in these two lines of the address will tell the ULA whether the CPU is trying to access the lower RAM at the same time uh, as the ULA is trying to do so as well. If that is the case, the ULA simply withholds the clock signal from the CPU. So the clock doesn't tick for the CPU and the CPU comes to a halt. It says if time didn't pass for the CPU. And then the ULA can go ahead and access the lower RAM, read out uh, the information in the video mapped uh, uh, address spaces of the RAM and produce luminance and, and color signals to be displayed on the television. So that in a nutshell is the spectrum architecture. All right, so 
These are the main elements uh, of the board. This is the voltage regulator. It's a 7805 voltage regulator. It takes in the 9 volts that comes in here from the power supply, 9 volts DC, direct current, and it transforms it to a 5 uh, a volt signal, a regular, uh, re regulated 5 volt signal, which is then distributed to the logic. This circuitry here, up to and including this stage here with two transistors, that's an internal DC power supply. It's, it produces two other voltages, minus 5 and plus 12 volts. Uh, I think this rail would be a 12 volt rail. We can test it uh, uh, in a moment. So this is power supply. This is the internal speaker. The ZX Spectrum does not send sound information via the video signal. Sound comes out through here. The main chip uh, on the board, well, arguably there are two main chips. One is the CPU. This is a, a, a Z80 CPU, a Zilog Z80 CPU, very popular in the 80s, together with the, with the 6502. Uh, these two CPUs dominated the 8-bit computers of the time. And then the ULA. The ULA is an uncommitted logic array. Um, maybe I should explain to you what an uncommitted logic array is. It's almost a custom chip. So let me do it right now for good measure. I'm showing you two micrographs of two different chips. This is what you would see if you would crack open that black epoxy uh, package of the chip and look at what is inside, look at the dye inside uh, with a microscope. Here on the left side, there is an uncommitted logic array or ULA or gate array, whatever you want to call it. And on the right side, there is a actual fully customized chip which we call an ASIC, an application-specific integrated uh, circuit. Um, on the ULA side, what you see is that below, there is a sea of some standard uh, uh, logic element. Uh, I will highlight one here for you uh, in red. And you see that uh, uh, on the bottom and the lower, lowest layer, uh, you have just an array, a repetition of these uh, uh, logic, this general purpose logic elements that you see in here. I'm only highlighting four. And, uh, and these uh, uh, logic elements, they are pretty general purpose. You have a sea of them. They don't perform any specific function until you wire them together in a certain way. And it's the wiring of these uh, logic elements that constitutes the function the chip will actually perform. Uh, uh, a chip maker can actually prefabricate uh, the lower uh, um, layer here with the standard logic uh, elements and keep them in storage. And when a customer comes with a specific, specific function, the chip maker will just add the wire on top, which we call the metallization layers or the metal layers. Here is one wire highlighted in yellow. There are a number of them. I'm highlighting a few more, uh, but there are many more than what I'm highlighting here. I think if you get, get, get the hang of it, you will see exactly what, what the wires are. And it is these wiring of a standard C of logic elements underneath that constitutes the customization. So only the wiring is customized. In the case of a truly fully customized chip, not only the wiring, but the logic elements in the underlying layers are also fully customized in the sense that you only put the logic elements you need where you need them, as opposed to a sea of the same kind of logic element. And this allows for much higher performance and much lower power dissipation because the wires are shorter, you don't have redundant stuff sitting around in your chip doing nothing, as is the case with the ULA. The wires in the ULA are also longer because you may need to connect uh, to uh, logic cells that are further away as opposed to getting rid of this standard uh, logic element and just putting the specific gates you want very close to each other. So that is the rationale why a ULA is only partly customized and therefore not very efficient in terms of power or in terms of performance. Although this chip consolidates a lot of functions in this architecture, a lot of the glue logic, a lot of the interfacing logic, um, it is not really totally customized, which has as a consequence uh, the fact that uh, this chip consumes a lot of power since it's not fully uh, customized and it gets very hot and it's a very common point of failure in the ZX Spectrum architecture, in all Sinclair computers actually, uh, the ULAs are a common point of failure. Now the CPU produces, the 
that performs all the calculations. The ULA glues everything together and also produces the video signal together with this chip here, which is a chroma chip that, that helps produce the color information. And the resulting composite signal comes through here into this can. And this can is the RF modulator, which basically just takes the composite signal and modulates it according to a carrier radio frequency uh, 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 signal and pretends, makes the computer pretend to be a television broadcasting station so it could uh, send images to the uh, old-fashioned analog televisions of the time. So this is the RF modulator. It has two parts. This part here is the carrier generation circuitry. It just produces a, a signal of a certain uh, radio frequency, uh, um, a, a precise frequency or a narrow frequency band. And then this circuit, circuitry here is the actual modulator. It will modulate the carrier frequency with the composite signal coming from the ULA, coming from this logic here, the video logic. And this combination is what is sent out uh, here. Today, we don't need a uh, radio frequency modulator anymore because today's televisions accept composite signals directly. Uh, so what I will do, I will perform a modification in which instead of having this signal be modulated, I will transfer it almost directly to this RCA jack here. I will just add a capacitor for decoupling. decoupling. I'll explain this later. Um, what, else, what else do we have? This is the base memory, 16 kilobytes of memory that comes in every ZX Spectrum model. It's the, 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 what some people call the lower memory or the contendent memory. And the reason is, unlike uh, the MSX architecture we reviewed in the previous episode, both user memory and video memory are together in this set of chips here. So when the CPU is accessing this memory to perform calculations and the ULA is trying to uh, produce the signal for the next frame to be displayed on the television, uh, they will contend for access to the same memory bank here. Uh, in the MSX, if you remember, the video part was separated out. Uh, it would be uh, exclusive to the video display processor. Here it's contended. That's why this is called contended memory or lower memory because it's in the lower area of the address space. And this extra memory here, this is another 32 kilobytes. So together this and this form 48 kilobytes of memory. This is a so-called uh, upper memory or the non-contended memory because the ULA doesn't use this memory here. The ULA only uses this memory to map video information. So this is non-contendent and the CPU has free access to it. Now this here, these are address decoders. Well, multiplexers and some other logic, but ha they have the effect of translating an address that they get from the CPU into the appropriate control signals to drive this memory here into producing uh, uh, data the data that the CPU is looking for, or even writing data to it. Under the heatsink, I'll show you better later, but here under the heatsink, there are another three chips similar to these three, and those are the decoding logic, address decoding logic for the lower memory. So lower memory, the address is decoded here, on, and the upper memory, the address is decoded here. This is just the ROM, which contains uh, the BIOS and the basic interpreter programming. It's in here. And this is just a video that helps the computer produce color information. That's about it. Everything else are just resistors, bypass capacitors, uh, um, some, some power circuitry, nothing too significant. These are crystal oscillators. Uh, one of these, at least, will produce uh, the original signal that becomes the clock. The clock is then produced by the ULA and sent to the CPU. And as we've just seen in the architecture review, uh, this is done in this way. It's a bit of a hack. But uh, when the ULA and the CPU are contending for the same memory and the ULA sees that the CPU is trying to access the memory together with it, the ULA can just turn off the clock for the CPU. So time stops for the CPU. It's a bit of a hack. I wouldn't do things this way. But uh, well, they, they, it, it works and it's cheap. So I guess it's fine. And the other oscillator has 
probably something to do with the video signal generator. I'm not sure, I didn't study it thoroughly, uh, but I don't see another reason for there to be two oscillators in here. So that's it uh, for uh, the overview. What we can do now is discuss our plans uh, for this thing. Here's our plan of action uh, for this computer. The first thing I plan to do is to replace the linear voltage regulator. I replaced it with a modern version that is uh, rated for 2 amperes. The original uh, is rated for only 1 ampere. The reason I'm doing this is to give myself room to add uh, uh, an extension to this computer, to add a device here on the edge connector that will also draw some current. Um, what, I, what I will be doing is probably exaggerated, I probably don't really need it, but I want to feel good that there is an overrated linear voltage regulator here that will last for a long time. These devices, they, uh, they, they operate under a lot of heat and they don't last forever. So that's the first thing I'm going to do. Um, I could think of replacing it with a modern switch mode uh, DC to DC power supply. But I don't think that is needed. The main advantage of those modern switch mode power supplies is that they are more efficient. They dissipate less energy. What this linear regulator does, it transforms 9 volts uh, to 5 volts regulated. And the remaining 4 volts, it just dissipates as heat through this enormous heat sink here. So it's not very efficient. But that only makes a difference when you're dealing with a battery-powered device, which this, which this computer is not. The only remaining reason to do that would have been to deal with heat. But since I'm going to upgrade this spectrum to a spectrum plus case, which is larger and has a lot more air circulation, I don't think that will be needed at all. So I will just uh, stick to a 2 ampere uh, linear voltage regulator instead of a 1 ampere DC to DC switch mode power supply. I want to have that extra room in current. The other thing I'm going to do, which I, which I always do, is to preemptively replace all electrolytic capacitors. When you buy these devices in the data sheet, you see the number of hours uh, that you can use them for. Uh, they have a shelf uh, life. Uh, beyond that, they fail. They can leak. Uh, some, some of them can, can even pop like popcorn. And if they leak, they, they, they wreck uh, the, the board, they wreck the PCB. Uh, so you don't want that. These things are now, what, over 35 years old. It is time to change them. They also drift out of spec when they get old. The electrolytic fluid inside uh, uh, dries up and the performance characteristics change. So they may not be within spec, even if they uh, aren't leaking yet. I'm also going to implement a composite video modification, as I alluded to earlier. Uh, we don't need RF modulators anymore, since uh, modern televisions can already interpret the original composite signal, and modulating them, uh, modulating this signal would just add noise. So we don't need that. I'm going to implement a reversible composite video modification here, inside, well, just outside the can of the RF modulator. It will be visible, but it will be neat. And finally, a big upgrade, uh, these two chips, the CPU and the ULA, um, they work pretty hard uh, in the ZX Spectrum line. The ULA is notorious for, for getting very hot, um, and they are a, a common point of failure because of this high operating current. The hotter the chip runs, the shorter uh, its lifetime. Um, so we will preemptively replace the ULA with a modern uh, um, the CMOS equivalent, a chip made with CMOS technology, which runs a lot cooler, uh, drains a lot less current, and it's a lot more robust, uh, will survive for a much longer time, and I will keep this chip uh, in my uh, repository of historical, <laughs> historical parts. Uh, the CPU as well, in some spectrums, the original Z80 is known for not meeting the specifications performance is not uh, uh, optimal enough to meet specifications, which can lead, can lead to some uh, uh, problems. So I'm going to replace the Z80 with another modern Z80. Uh, Zilog still makes this, these devices in, in modern CMOS technology. I uh, will replace it with one that can run at up to 8 MHz instead of 3.5 MHz. So it will comfortably meet all the specifications of the spectrum and it will also run cooler and drain a lot less current from the linear voltage regulator here. 
So the end result should be a spectrum that runs a lot cooler, is a lot more robust and will last a long time.